Should I get started? Yeah, good. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for joining this session and this panel. I'm going to let uh, my panelists introduce themselves. We all have a few minutes to come and talk about OPEN as a prerequisite for solving the climate crisis. Uh, but before we do get started, I just want to acknowledge one colleague, Maxwell Bregenman, Beganen, who is from Wiki Green, who was not able to join us because he was not able to get a visa despite applying for a visa twice. So we do have a video from him as well that will be part of Lucas's presentation. So he is definitely here with us in spirit. So hand things off to you, Melissa. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, and I'm very pleased to join this session today. My name is Melissa Hegman, and I've been working on open access since around 2002 um, with the Open Society Foundations. And um, now I'm working to um, transition the Budapest Open Access Initiative, which first defined open access into an organization. So with that, um, I would like to um, begin to talk about advocating for open access in critical fields. Now, this is um, uh, a strategy which um, uh, one of the leading examples came into play at the beginning of the pandemic. So at that time, the Wellcome Trust and leaders from around the world called on researchers and journals and funders to make all, oh, thank you. Yes, there we go. To make um, all research related to COVID-19 openly available or freely available for the duration of the outbreak. Now, this strategy saw resounding success and uh, brought the research, publishing, and scholarly communications communities together through a shared cause that resulted in more than 350,000 articles being made openly available. However, as some of the articles were only made available for the duration of the pandemic, um, and uh, some of them have now been placed behind paywalls and approximately 12% of um, this research which had been made openly available is now behind paywalls. So during the pandemic, as we were witnessing policymakers and researchers and publishers responding to the call to make research on COVID-19 open, uh, my former colleague Francis Pinter and I began a series of discussions around adapting the same model for another clear and present danger, that of climate change. So shockingly, 49% of research published on climate science is locked behind paywalls. Now, Francis and I formed a steering committee and uh, secured the partnership of Creative Commons and Spark and Eiffel to lead the project, as well as seed funding from the Open Society Foundations and support from Arcadia to launch the Open Climate Campaign. Now, halfway through the intended timeline of the campaign, the impact of the impact is clear in terms of prioritizing climate for open access is very much needed. So at a time when open access continues to be contested by, commercial, by um, commercially driven approaches, a call to action for the community to address cli the climate crisis through open access provided a much needed and a re-energization of the open access movement. So targeting the development of open access in specific, in specific fields can mobilize and educate communities. Beyond COVID-19 and, and climate research, one could think of using this model for fields such as cancer research, as well as uniting the public health community around advocating for uh, open access for emerging uh, infectious diseases, including drug-resistant infections. In addition, this approach could be applied to the Sustainable Development Goals, as currently only 56% of papers on SDGs are open access. 
So this is a strategy which um, could help to mobilize and educate communities by working specifically on one field. And um, it has been pioneered um, by COVID and now working in the field of climate science. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Rebecca to talk more about the Open Climate Campaign. All right, thanks very much, Melissa. So I am thrilled to have the opportunity to build on Melissa's presentation and talk about our work at Creative Commons and around open access to climate research as I just wait for my slides. There we go. So Melissa provided some really good background in terms of the notion of prioritizing open access in critical fields. And my colleagues and I at Creative Commons really had the opportunity to put this strategy to the test. And when I was working on this presentation, you know, I really thought that I could title it something like open access is the only way and open access is also extremely broken. And having had the opportunity to work on open access models for a number of years, I really started to feel kind of hopeless and, and jaded to a certain extent. And as Melissa mentioned, this idea of focusing our efforts around a specific field really helped to re-energize the open access movement, not just at Creative Commons and with our partners, but I would say across academic libraries and other knowledge producing institutions at large. So we have today entered this paradox of openness where we have more open access content than ever before, and yet we're spending more money with commercial publishers than ever before. So these for-profit publishers seek to control access to knowledge for corporate and shareholder profit. However, having the opportunity to work at the intersection of open access and climate justice really has an opportunity to flip the switch on the models that exist right now. So let's get into our approach. Everyone in this room pretty much knows that we use access to information to inform decision making on the world's greatest challenges. And one of the world's greatest challenges today is mitigating the climate crisis. But we don't always have access to the information. We don't always have access to climate change knowledge. And it's not just us who don't have access. It is journalists, policymakers, teachers, students, uh, traditional knowledge keepers, and folks at the community level who are also disproportionately affected by the climate crisis. What I hadn't fully understood, though, is how little access we actually have. So through the campaign, we did a lot of bibliometric research, and we found that actually only 50% of all climate research is available as open access. This is obviously a really big problem. So we thought that this strategy of focusing on a specific field really worked for tackling this problem. And as Melissa said, that's sort of how we started the open climate campaign. So Melissa and I have both already talked about the why of this, um, but I want to go into it in a little bit more of a detail. So we thought at the climate campaign that we really wanted to talk about our whys in a way that were super tangible and that really felt like they would make a difference to folks. And I think that that is a step that we sometimes miss as a community in terms of that advocacy, you know, just saying open is important, but we really wanted to talk about why is opens important? And so our three whys with the campaign is that we do this to increase equitable collaboration that will support finding faster solutions to the climate crisis. The word equitable here is extremely important because faster solutions to solving the climate crisis that are not equitable are not in fact solutions. So we really have to make sure that they are equitable solutions. We do this because we believe in a robust knowledge commons, which helps to fight the information crisis. And we do this because we wanna see a systemic shift in scholarly communications that is sustainable, equitable, and community driven. And like Melissa, I often find myself talking about this in terms of the SDGs. 
So uh, there is obviously a goal in the SDGs about climate action, but I would really argue that access to climate research is required to meet all of these SDGs. And further than that, access to information and this research is important in terms of us evaluating how we're doing in meeting these SDGs. So our approach at the Open Climate Campaign is multifaceted. We work on policy, we work on coalition convening, we uh, work on advocacy with a number of partners, and we also have our open workshop where we do a lot of different experiments on open access. We also know that our work will shift and evolve depending on funding availability and resources and other priorities. So we aim to keep ourselves super agile and making sure that we are meeting our principles and our goals. So our principles are, as it is on the screen, sharing knowledge is a social justice issue. Accelerating progress requires equity, inclusivity, and global empowerment. And knowledge about our world is a public good. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about some early findings two years into the campaign. So here's a list of what we found to date. I know the text is small and I'm gonna go through each one of these in a little bit more detail. Policy change is slow and the climate crisis cannot wait. Through the campaign, we worked with 15 national governments all over the world on open access policies using climate as a driver. Policy work is about deep systematic change and it is generational, it's certainly not a quick fix. Policy work is also really difficult to promote because the national governments themselves have communication plans and strategies for rolling this out. Also, policy change is not a one-to-one -one fix. So we know that we're not gonna be able to count the exact number of open access papers that happen as a result of these policy changes. So a lesson here is that while policy work is incredibly important, we really need to balance it with some activities and initiatives that affect quick change, that sort of build on the momentum of the work that we're doing. So one of the biggest insights we had with our work is that this is really not a hard sell at all in terms of making open access, a, a climate research open access. So I remember at the beginning of my career working in open access, I sort of would hesitate to answer when someone would ask me what I did for a living because it just felt overly complicated to explain. And sometimes I just wanted to say something like, I'm a dentist, something that everyone could understand. But when I started working on the open climate campaign, when I said, you know, I'm working to make research available to help mitigate the climate crisis, people got it right away. It was very compelling. And that was a bit of a clue about how important this work is and how people really wanted to start talking about it and thinking about it. So institutions and researchers often want ways to meet their own climate action plans. You know, so what if we started thinking about things like institutional repositories as a tool for collective climate action? We asked ourselves if we could position the deposit of author accepted manuscripts in these repositories as a way for, to make an individual and a collective act towards making research available as open access. So to explore this in more detail, we launched our paper pledge for the planet. So this is one of the projects in our open workshop and we use bibliometric data to uh, develop a set of criteria to have a list of research papers that are closed access that we wanna make open access. And this way we work with institutional repository managers to reach out to those researchers and have that research deposited in open repositories. And when my colleague Monica launched this at the Open Repository Conference in June, I think, it was met with overwhelming support because, again, folks really want to find a way to support the climate movement. So another lesson um, that really we found with the campaign is that the entrenchment with commercial publishers is so deep. And for me, I feel really strongly that new open access business models is not going to be the answer to this problem. 
The climate crisis really can't wait for us to sort out our business models. So that means that we need to think about a different framework when we do this work. We need to think about this work through the lens of social justice, human rights, and not sort of be uh, stuck in this narrow lens of sorting out business models. So in thinking about that, we have another experiment as part of our open workshop, and it's called Unbinding. One of the members in our steering committee, Peter Suber, had actually published a paper about 20 years ago to talk about how we could reach out to uh, publishers and ask them to make research available in a certain field, like Melissa was talking about. And we thought we would apply this to climate research. First, we needed a list to work against. So we looked at the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, sixth assessment report. We used bibliometric research to figure out how many papers that were cited in the IPCC report were available as open access. Turns out about 60% of those papers cited are open access. That's pretty good, but that's still another 40% that are not available as open access. And what's interesting is of the papers that are available as open access, only about 40% of them have an open license, and only about 30% of those have a CC BY license. So now we have another goal that we can work towards, which is also applying open licenses to papers that are available as open access. And, you know, I think that it can seem like perhaps a little naive to say, like, we're just going to reach out to publishers. We're going to ask them to make this research available as open access. But remember that the publishers themselves also have climate action plans and climate goals that they want to meet. And we're giving them a way of doing that and buying a bit of goodwill with the community. So far, with the publishers we've spoken with, there has been a tremendous amount of support. And we're quite optimistic. And so I think also, I talked about this at the beginning, but really making sure that we're communicating what is at stake with both a sense of urgency and also a sense of optimism. Uh, there is a lot of eco-anxiety out there and being able to say to folks, you know, depositing your research in a repository or making sure that you have an open license is something that you can do feels really tangible and important. Okay, so where do we go from here? In terms of the Open Climate Campaign, I would say, like Melissa, it is extremely clear that discipline-specific approaches to OA really works. And I think it's largely because it's a movement of movements. So this movement works at the intersection of both the open access movement and the climate justice movement. And these intersections of movement are extremely important. So what we're gonna do at Creative Commons is take stock of the work that we've done and uh, kind of develop these frameworks so that others can follow, so that we can develop this at scale as a community and really work to chip away at that 50% of papers that are locked behind paywalls. Um, but regardless, I know that uh, open climate will remain a core strategy for all of us in terms of open access. And so anyone who wants to chat more about this, please let us know. And with that, I'm gonna pass it over to Jan. Let's see if I get my slides. There he is. So, hello, my name is Jan Einali. I'm a Wikimedian since 2006. Uh, I have the Gdansk t shirt. That was my third Wikimania. Uh, but right now, today, I'm working with Creative Commons since May on the Open Climate data project, which is sort of like a, a, a sub-project to, to what uh, we have been talking about before. So some things are sort of repeated, but I'm, I'm going to try to make it good. Uh, so, so what we really try to do here is we, we're trying to facilitate better sharing of climate data. And like Rebecca said, we have had a lot of good reception from these institutions who are creating uh, climate data. So what we're really trying to do is more hands-on, helping them to share this in a good way. So a lot of these institutions are really large, which means they have hundreds, maybe thousands of employees, so they need policies for the data sharing. So we help them create 
better policies internally so they know how to do it. We even make them uh, like help them do audits on their publishing platforms so that the CC licenses are in the top of the selection list and not in the bottom. So it's going to be more like more of a default to share it uh, properly. We also help with trainings, uh, sometimes in group or like one on one. So really practically trying to get the climate institutions to work in a good and open way. And of course, uh, we have already touched upon this, but th there's an urgency of the climate data to get the data out there so that we immediately can start using it in research and for planning to, to create better policies and action and mitigation in different kinds of ways, because this is happening right now. We, we cannot wait. And it's also like the, the importance of the specific of the climate data is that we need to have data-driven decisions. So we're not making things ad hoc too much. And it's also important that we inform the policy of this data and also that, uh, get a public awareness so that the public can feel that they own this and become a part of the community that will sort of like grow this environmental stewardship. And by creating sharing uh, practices, we want to sort of enable a global collaboration. So we're not doing this in islands separate from each other, but uh, working together. And of course, like the people who are creating this climate data, they have access to it already and their own researchers ha have access. So who are the beneficiaries of actually releasing it as open data? Well. We, we have the general public, but also like the civic tech and the NGOs that can go out and start uh, holding the authorities accountable so that everybody knows this is not some secret data, uh, but rather that we can understand it together. It also enables uh, businesses and private sector to create solutions that we're going to need uh, to be able to put everything in place. And even if we have the knowledge, like in one institution, uh, it might not be available as easily if it's not open data on local levels or across regions or like continents. So we need also there to, to be working together. And what we, in this project, uh, the Open Climate Data Campaign, uh, or Open Climate Data Project, we have been doing on, working on two different fields. So we have come up with a recommended licensing and legal terms to really maximize the, the, the sharing of the, the data. And we also come up with some recommendations of the metadata values that makes it clear how the license is actually working, that the attribution and the provenance is proper so that we can have a trust, a chain of trust of uh, whatever we are publishing and re reusing. And I, Imagine most of you people here in this room already know about the Creative Commons licenses, but uh, if you didn't, like we have uh, four different conditions that we together can uh, combine to six different licenses. Uh, and what you perhaps didn't know as well is that you, we can see these as different layers. We have the legal terms that are for the lawyers. We also have the one that you probably come across, the human readable layer that uh, actually explains it very easily for uh, someone. But there's also a layer for machine readability so we can create apps and uh, um, other tools to, to use this. And if they are available, the version four uh, of attribution in these languages, but we encourage people who know more languages to help join our translation community so we can get it into to more. And in this project, we have sort of, uh, you can rank this from least free to most free. And we have focused really around on the two most free one to enable more uh, project uh, uh, sharing. And here I also added the, the public domain dedication, which isn't really an, uh, uh, an, a license, but a dedication to the public domain, the CC0. And you, you see it's grayed out here, but of course you know that the CC by SA, the, the share alike, is also allowed on Wikimedia Commons. So if you see a data set out there that you think, oh, 
I, I think this would be useful on Wikimedia Commons. Those are also available. We recommend the climate producer and data producers to do it even freer to, to make it easy. But uh, for Wikimedia Commons, that will also be fine. And our first recommendation is really to, to use the CC0, but have an attribution request. So this will enable the maximal ease of sharing of the data, whereas uh, we ask people to attribute this. And of course, this is what professionals want to do anyway, because they want to have uh, show that the trust where the data comes from, the provenance. But by using CC0, you remove the most legal complexities. Uh, so make it the easiest way as possible. And the second option is then for uh, organizations who cannot uh, or have policies already. Uh, some jurisdictions, it might be hard for uh, public organizations to reassign it to the public domain. We recommend the CC BY then, which still is fairly easy compared to some of the other uh, options. And for attributions, we, we really have this tassel as, as a re you can remember how you should uh, give a good attribution, title, attribution, source, and license. And here you see an example of it. And for the other part, the recommended metadata values, uh, we work together with W3C. And uh, here are the list of the metadata values that we have uh, come up that you should have, title, publisher, identifier, and license are fairly straightforward. There's also this right statement, which is more of a human readable, but more uh, ex longer explanation of how you can re use this uh, works. And then also a bibliographical citation, which explains this is how we want to be cited. And you might also see, oh, I recognize some of these as properties on Wikidata. And for structured data on commons, we already have the title, the publisher, the identifier, and copyright license. Unfortunately, though, uh, we don't have structured data in the data namespace yet. So that is something as, now I have my Wikimedia hat on, something that I think we should enable. We should uh, ask to get this enabled for the data namespace as well, because right now we can only use this on files. But of course, we want to have this on the data to show the provenance easily and also make the data more queryable and multilingual, because the way we can put in references in the data namespace right now is not very easy to do in a multilingual way. And we already have some examples on Wikimedia Commons. So Wikimedia Canada have been working together with the Environment and Climate Change Canada and publish uh, weather data from uh, different institutions. And in the data namespace, we have opportunity to publish tabular data, but also a map data. Uh, and even though I show an image here of a map, this is not the map data. This is actually data from uh, the Wikidata. Uh, uh, so we have multiple ways of storing uh, climate data and relate data on uh, the Wikimedia platforms. We also have a lot of data from NOAA from, on Wikimedia Commons. But unfortunately, right now, the, uh, the, the charts are broken. So we cannot display the graph, no, the graph uh, is uh, disabled. So we cannot show that on the Commons platforms. But tomorrow, there will be a session on charts, the successor of uh, graph. So hopefully, we we'll see some bright future for that tomorrow. It's in tomorrow morning. And I think that was what I had. And I think it's Lucas now and not in Q&A. Hi everyone, uh, thanks for having me here. Um, my name is Lucas Preci. I am the current uh, Director of Advocacy and Communications at the Open Knowledge Foundation. But uh, in my heart, I'm actually an activist. Uh, and I'm not the one who should be here. Uh, that's why I also thank you for having me here. 
because I'm talking about an initiative from our colleague from the Open Knowledge Network, Maxwell Beganin, as uh, Rebecca told you before. We will hear his words like in just one minute. Because he came up with this idea and he's actually, as he describes himself, like a, an ecosystem builder. Um, and that's exactly what he's doing. Actually, he is part of like many initiatives. He's from Ghana, from Accra. Uh, and, and he's like involved with many layers of uh, local grassroots activism there. And thinking is that has to do with uh, with the digital culture world, but it also has to do with like humanitarian uh, activism and many many other things. And then he starts uh, actually knocking on every door and and every organization that could enable or provide a platform or give him or and the movement structure for that. Uh, and the Open Knowledge Foundation and the, and the Open Climate Campaign is, is one of those. So he came up with this idea, like, why don't we get, like, openness, the openness discussion uh, into the COP level, where actually, like, the decisions about uh, climate crisis are happening, right? Like, pragmatically, like, we can, uh, of course, the problem is systemic, like, the problem is capitalism. I mean, all the research uh, in open access or whatever we are seeing here, we can do most of them, but, like, they need to be actually applied and policies need to ch actually change and governments need to to commit to things, and that's happening in the COP level, right? In the United Nations convening this thing. So that's why, like, this guy from um, one, you know, grassroots initiative in, in Ghana come up and say, like, oh, we, we need to do this. We said, like, yes, we need to, you know? So we, we started doing what we are calling, like, a movement advocating for openness in the UN Climate Change Conference. Uh, these are the logos, uh, but it's not actually an institutional... Uh, initiatives, I would say. Wiki Green Initiatives is actually one of the organizations uh, Max is involved with uh, in Ghana. Uh, this is the Open Knowledge Network. Uh, we, we are, let's say, mm, signing this campaign as a network because it's also not an you know institutional initiative from the foundation and it's like we don't have like any you know, funding for that. We are just actually kind of volunteering as well from the network. You see, like, another examples from the network uh, in a minute. Uh, the Open Climate Campaign is another door that Max <laughs> knocked it in, saying, like, oh, you're doing this thing, like, we should do it together. And then when we started the campaign, the Open Data Charter also raised their hand, saying, oh, we are, we are uh, observers of COP, so we could also, um, you know, help and open doors and stuff. And that's why we put, like, plus you, and because it's actually and a growing uh, recent newly created coalition movement slash whatever initiative uh, that we want to actually maybe next year and next week in many or many other events like have like the screen full of logos or faces or whatever you know so I'm just putting kind of like highlighting the non heavily institutional initiative that we are trying to, to do here but let's hear from from Max I'm already talking too much I, I give the play here? No. How do, how do I do it? Should I? No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, that's it. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Maxo Bigani from um, Ghana, but currently in South Africa. Uh, I had to. Uh, join you for this meeting and this session, but unfortunately, because of um, a lot of visa issues, um, I wasn't able to secure a visa to attend um, the event, and that's very unfortunate because uh, the reasons um, given for the denial of visa didn't really um, make a lot of sense, but uh, we, we have an opportunity to use this platform to also uh, part, uh, have this session will be included in the session. So just as I said, my name is Max Obigani, and I am the co-lead or I co-lead on this um, Open Ghost Cop coalition that uh, we started or an initiative that we started from the Wiki Green Initiative together with Creative Commons Open um, Climate Campaign and also um, Open Knowledge Foundation, Open um, Data, and open data chatter and 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 you of course uh here so the whole conceptualization and the idea was that if you look at the unf 
triple C processes, you realize that there is no integration of the concept of open and the concept of open here, where we mean accessibility or information being open to the public. So uh, within the framework, we decided to think around how we can start pushing that narrative of open where all the essential um, documentations, all the draft texts and everything that is uh, included within that process of the UNF triple C become very open and then all all of us can have access to it. And so that is the brain behind everything um, that we are trying to do. So we call on all open enthusiasts, all open actors to come on board for us to shift the narrative, for us to also be included in this whole climate science conversation in terms of advocacy, in terms of strategy. We need to have a common grounds. We need to have a representation. So there should be an open representation in the climate space, in, in, in the UNF C process. Uh, I would end here, and I know um, Lucas would uh, expand shit more on some of the issues that I have um, shared. And I would wish that you have a great session on the intersection between open and then climate science. Thank you very much. And then I look forward to seeing you soon. Yeah, this is Max. Uh, I don't know if I need to do another statement on like the how absurd is the situation of like not only Max, but like many of, our, of people from our networks don't get visa is like not exclusive from Wikimania. Like the rights con last year, there was like a big issue around that for uh, Costa Rica. They just changed it like the, the for Taiwan. Let's see what happens next year. But like there are like many other uh, mute stakeholder. Mm, there's many adjectives that we can use here that like are really not allowing people to circulate. Uh, and I mean. Uh, like open knowledge and closed borders. I mean, that's that's something we're really getting super overwhelmed with and and outraged actually. And uh, we cannot really build movements without a person like him and many others uh, not present in this room anyway. So just wanna again use this microphone just to shout out and to you know state and let's let's scream about it, everyone, because it's it's really an absurd. Uh, anyway, um, we are now. Hello, everyone. Okay, not again. <laughs> oh, enough of Max. <laughs> uh, so these are, um, well, this is an ongoing process. Um, we let, let me go one slide then, then you can see more or less like the timeline. We have just started. Uh, like in June 5, we run a, a, what we call like our first webinar, uh, like in the celebrating the World Environment Day. Uh, and the webinar was basically, um, let's do it together. It's a call for people who are interested in on it, and, and, and let's come together. And Open Data Charter was not yet there, and then they joined. So we are starting to actually uh, create some buzz and create momentum around it. Um, and then we run uh, a second webinar in July, like less than a month ago, uh, with some structure. I'll, I'll show you in, in, in a minute. And then there's the third webinar to be decided. So it, that's very much, uh, let's say, recent and newly created, like with no governance. And actually, this is something I'm trying to put in the coalition and, and talking to Rebecca and others. It's like, you know, let's not do meta conversations for now. You know, like, oh, what's the governance? Who decides on what? Like, I mean, let's just do things because that's urgent. And then we figure out things in the way, you know? So if there's any funder in this room that wants to, <laughs> uh, not only funder, but like people that, of course, want to join efforts, but also want to give and push for structure, we are more than welcome to. To, to receive you and to work on you, with you and whatever details or paperwork is needed for for you. <laughs> uh, but getting back to it, like this is the goals that we collaboratively did in the past few uh, weeks. Actually, this is, as I said, ongoing uh, work. We are trying to catalyze conversation, uh, build momentum, build capacity between open movement activists because there's a huge uh, gap between the open movement or mm, however we call it, medians or uh, digital culture or whatever, and, uh, and the climate justice people and scientists and stuff. So we are trying to bridge you know, those two worlds. Um, and also, they, like many open uh, movement activists, are not really equipped with, with the things that are required for uh, actually influencing the conversation in the climate uh, 
crises and, and, and levels, you know. Uh, so we are also doing, uh, we want to support climate-driven climate action initiatives at a local level, so that Max is an example, and I'll bring you one more from Brazil now. Um, we want to make information about co-processes freely available because that's also another thing, like it's actually a black box. If you go there into the COP processes, it's like, no, how does it work? And people who have gone to, to COP is like, oh, there's the green zone, the blue, whatever. What, what is actually happening here, you know? It's like bureaucracy, bureaucracy is like, it looks like they're there putting more barriers to, you know, kind of like avoid action. So that's also like a, a information that we need to make freely available and that's, Something we did in, in, the, in the first podcast, like you know, being really didactic about like what's COP and how to influence that process. Uh, and of course, as a final outcome, we don't know if we will be able to do it. Like we want to actually activate the negotiators and people who can really change words in the room and make decisions to listen to what's happening in terms of really influencing the documentation and stuff. This is not a goal for this year, of course, because we are. Uh, I don't think we'll make you know, have time for that, to actually create, I mean, critical mass around the movement. But this is definitely something we are uh, pointing to next COP in Brazil, because there's also more, uh, let's say, favorable political context in the Amazon. There's like some momentum, like in the end of next year, that we hope to be, I mean, stronger as, as, as a movement. Um, this I showed you, this is a gift just to show the vibes <laughs> of the webinars. Uh, I don't want to highlight the diversity because it's obvious. Uh, and, and we think that's how you build movement and that's how we are trying to build our network as well today. Um, this is Natalia Carfi from Open Data Charter uh, doing uh, her intervention in the last webinar. She went more like technical about like what, doesn't, what does like open climate data means. It's very complicated actually. Uh, so it's also like opening up, uh, you know, the discussions and I mean that's why like many people here probably know more than us and her about it and she's uh, the Open Data Charter is now uh, an official observer so we have like this like, small door open to to crack and to get into the room so please come to join I ju just want to show you like you now what what the kind of things we are discussing and we, and for each seminar we are also uh, highlighting one initiative uh, we want to focus on local things more than, more than like the you know top level um, world class stuff. And this is Aide, who is in the room. <laughs> She's the director of Open Knowledge Brazil and part of the network. And they have a really, what I would say, very exemplary, uh, really cool local project that is called the Climate Diaries. That basically scans every day every official gazette from every municipality. Uh, to find, you know, laws and regulations, new things that are being told about climate, and and you can you can talk to her. That's easy than me talking about her. <laughs> um, so this is the kind of things we are discussing in the webinars. The third one will be probably decided in the next few weeks. We uh, oh, that's one important thing that I was just forgetting. Uh, we are trying to document this process. Uh, in a podcast format, uh, just because it's easier to listen than, well, personally, I don't believe that people go to community calls that are, you know, in YouTube and watch them happening after they <laughs> they were there. So, like, why why not just putting it on the audio verse and then then people can just go around and 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 see. This is the link. That's a, your opportunity to scan this thing and listen today. <laughs> Uh, that's the, the, the first podcast, uh, it's about the first webinar, the second one is in production uh, and will be launched very soon. And we have a, a domain uh, <laughs> that is uh, registered, but if you go there there's nothing, because we haven't had resources yet, but we will in the future, because we're also getting resources together and trying to do it like with the, with, you know, with the, the the strength we have and skills we have for now, uh, but that's how you can you can reach out and say uh, I want to join you and give you your contact to to be invited to the next webinar and hopefully grow this movement and really influence like the decisions uh, in the COP level. That's it. Thank you.
right. A big thank you to my co-panelists, Melissa, Jan, Lucas, and of course, Max as well. And we have 10 minutes left. Uh, so I know all of us would be very happy to answer any questions that you might have. Great. Uh, are we going to run the microphone? Okay, thank you. Okay, yeah. Um, it's not really a question, but I've got this system, ESGF. It's the world's largest repository of climate data, and it is available. So you can, if you want, you can take the whole lot and put it on um, Wikidata if you've got 16 Peter available. Um, but uh, this is the uh, the current version. The, I'd show you the new version, but I've bought the my Wikimedia laptop instead of the work laptop. But it's uh, the computer supercomputer center has all this data available and it's free. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to make um, give a suggestion and get the opinion of the panelists. If you discover, like um, in my experience last year attending the COP, because we work on, in my organization, which is part of the Open Knowledge Network, we work on climatic change issues. And I was talking to our Minister of Environment in the Gambia. I said between 2017 and 2022, you had over 3 million tons of rosewoods that were um, taken from the Gambia and southern Senegal to China, worth over $2 billion wanted to know what amount of rosewoods have been depleted, not just the tons, and what areas are affected. And she said, they're in these policy documents, but we can share the policy documents. And listening to everything that has been said, I look at, I said, okay, Bakwa Azerbaijan is, um, is too near, but Belém, which is a big center of the rainforest in Brazil, in the Para state, will be hosting the next COP, why is, is there a possibility that within this coalition, with what all of you have said, that we there's an engagement with policymakers, you know, from states, whereby their data they have can also be open, because then we can touch out the data better, and researchers can play a role. I would like to hear your opinion. Thank you. Do you want to answer? Yeah, yeah. I think uh, that's exactly what we were hoping yeah. the coalition would be able to enable and sort of collect ideas like that. So we would love to see you join the coalition, chat more about it, and we're really looking for ideas and ways to enable that coalition. And there's one thing that we are really discussing in the webinars, uh, which is uh, also like against the meta conversation that is also something that obsesses me is uh, we need to go uh, content driven in terms of uh, what we are doing, right? Like, so this is a task, right? So let's ask, uh, it's a campaign goal. It's uh, we can do whatever strategies we want uh, as activists to make pressure on these specific governments to open their data, la la la. So this is actually a very tangible outcome that we could, yes, start working with. But we need people like you and everyone in the room to put those tasks on the table, you know, because of course we are pushing the way we can, but we also don't have all the ideas and, and, and we don't know everyone in the world. So people well connected as you is like very much welcome to the to the coalition to to actually task us and task, uh, yeah, the governments or whoever we want to task uh, to do stuff, yeah. Thank you, this is fascinating. Uh, my name is Brisa, I'm Mexican-Brazilian, and this is more a common invitation because, well, next COP will happen in my region, in, in Latin America, and there is a very interesting momentum happening with the community there. They are uh, they just created a working group, group on climate justice, there is a conference happening on indigenous voices and climate change in Peru in November, so this is more of an invitation. I, actually, I work for the foundation. I'm the partnerships manager for Latin America, and I'm accompanying uh, this group of Wikimedians, affiliates, working on the issue. I think it will be very important to connect with them, especially because COP will be there. I know Wikimovimento Brazil are thinking about doing stuff, not only in the framework of COP, but 
with the actors that normally cannot get in COP. So they also have an interesting vision. So I think it would be marvelous if you connect this amazing initiative with all the efforts that are going on in Latin America around this topic because they are doing a great job. So just that. Thank you so much. A little question for Jan in that when I like publish stuff on the comments, I like to use CC by Isa. Uh, and I wonder, like, what's the uh, why is uh, using share like discouraged? It's not really discouraged, it's just that it makes it harder to combine uh, different data sources because share like requires the same license and the more different kinds of license flavors you have, the, the more complex it becomes. And it, like if you have C0, you have no things you have to uh, think about at all. Uh, so yeah, but we also have more here. <laughs> Cat is in the room, so. <laughs> also, also a lot of the data sets that they work with aren't copyrightable at all. Uh, so there, it just CC0 to indicate that that's true, but attribution requested because it's still very good for lots of reasons to acknowledge where it came from. <laughs> Lewis is also in the room. Uh, yeah, hi. I, I'm an IP attorney. Um, the uh, there uh, like climate data research sets and and uh, uh, bioscience in general often are drawing from hundreds of different databases at once. And as soon as you get copylefts, especially multiple different copylefts into that stack, compliance becomes not just like practically difficult. But legitimately, as soon as there's more than one copy left, it becomes legitimately impossible to do properly. Uh, and so uh, share alike is quite disfavored. There's some good uh, writing on this. I don't know who asked the question, but I'm happy to share some links uh, later if that would be helpful. My question is uh, to Rebecca and Melissa about the Open Climate Campaign. Uh, the way you've presented it, it's very much facing the closed guys, the closed communities. You're talking to them, engaging them in order to make climate-related stuff more open. To what, ex to what extent do you engage the open communities, that those that are already doing what you're asking the closed guys to do? Uh, how can we help you? How can you help us, basically? Yeah, thanks very much for that question. And it's something we uh, thought about immediately when we were looking at the paper cited in the IPCC report and how important it would be to celebrate all of the publishers who had already opened up their research um, to not just say like we're celebrating the ones that are now opening, but we're celebrating the ones that did that initially. So I think that is very much part of any open climate campaign that we need will have going forward, where we are calling attention, we're bringing attention, uh, we're surfacing the resources that are already openly available. Um, so that's certainly part of our priority. And I could see a future where, you know, we're using even a vehicle like Open Goes Cop to highlight um, collections of climate research that are available and really calling on the community to help pull that together. I don't know, Melissa, if you have anything to add. Okay. Yes, thank you. And thank you for the talk. Uh, this summer I went to the International Red Cross and I saw how uh, a, a library for, for victims of, of um, war could be a way that International Red Cross could help countries fighting each other. And I think, in a way, the same of Wikidata. So I would like to, to have your response. Uh, do you think that we could use Wikidata to, to help each other? Because Wikidata speaks all languages and we could, in a way, be this multinational uh, force that couldn't help each other with visualizing and and with analysts uh, on on all of these issues that we are facing and also I think that we could perhaps also uh, add some kind of consumption data that could be uh, useful to to have uh, visualized because uh, consum con the consumption is also the the part of the problem. Could, could you see Wikidata as a tool for us all to help making a joint force in this effort? Yeah, 
Yes, definitely. Now, Wikidata is not great for time series data, and that's where we can store data also on Wikimedia Commons for more, more of that granularity. Uh, and right now we're lacking good connections between those two, but that's an ongoing conversation and perhaps we will soon-ish find a solution so we actually also can state in a Wikidata item, here is the time series or something like that for that on Wikimedia Commons. We, we, we lack that today and I think we could probably need a session or two on that just to discuss like what are the needs that, uh, that we want from it. Uh, but I think as a start, uh, thinking about, well, is there some current data that we can put immediately on Wikidata or can we put the other ones on Commons for now and then later make the connection? I just want to add something that I'm, I'm not really an expert on it, but we have our uh, um, Sara here who is in the, the room. She is the project manager for frictionless data and she's working in a new um, project in the Open Knowledge Foundation called Open Data Editor that's really actually trying to solve the interoperability problem. Uh, and she will run a session in two days, I think, right? Um, so please just inviting you guys to be there because I think that's exactly the topic that she she's talking about. Yeah, it's called Frictionless Data for More Collaboration, so you can find it in the program. Uh, first and most importantly, thank you to each and every one of you for your, your very important work on this issue. Um, you know, thinking back to Melissa's introduction around this, seeing the ways in which the large commercial oligopoly, <laughs> right, um, of publishers, which are more accurately termed as information analytics companies, um, are you know, under the pressure of the COVID-19 crisis, um, made research publicly accessible, and then, you know, one could argue perhaps to hide the paywall um, that was then reinstated. Um, you know, one of the things that we've really seen around the Publishers Compact and other um, elements is the ways in which the large commercial publishers are tying the research that they hold, not that they produce, but that they hold, um, to various SCGs and are unable to state the degree to which that research is open or closed. Um, are there concerns about SDG washing um, in some of these um, conversations and, and how, because I know it's very sensitive, right? Because like we have to work with folks who have the research, right? Um, but also, how do we um, avoid open washing? How do we avoid SDG washing? Especially when a lot of these entities are um, heavily invested in the fossil fuel industry, right? Um, so, you know, how, do, how does one grapple with that? And I apologize that I'm asking that question when we're on film, but yeah. <laughs> and that's all the time we have. No, <laughs> no that's... <laughs> Um, I, I know a Skullcom's librarian when I see one. <laughs> yeah, that's a really important question. So I would say uh, my colleague Monica and I have, have talked quite a bit about this. And, and we're sort of of two minds. In terms of, you know, addressing the climate crisis, any access is good access in the short term, right? So if we can make it accessible, even if it's not true open access, even if it doesn't have a CC BY license, we're going to take that as a first step. But we see that really as a first step. And also, I think if, you know, an, an Elsevier or a Taylor and Francis, for example, is going to make a collection of research available as open access in perpetuity with a CC BY license, and they need you know, someone to pat them on the back and have a little bit of open washing. From the campaign perspective, that again was something that we could live with because of our dual objective of you know, addressing uh, you know, the systemic issue in scholarly communication and also making sure that we have access to climate research. But I think this is obviously something we have to have front of mind because we can't have the same thing that happened with the COVID research where they just put it back behind paywalls. So that question of licensing, I think is something that CC is 
looking at Anna, but something that CC is quite interested in in terms of uh, that climate research and really advocating for them to have CC licenses um, because they call it open and it's not really if it doesn't have a CC license. But that in itself could be a whole session and, and maybe we should do that next time. I think it's like a great call out. <laughs> And I think we only have time for one more question. We're already over time, but let's have one more. Uh, hi, my name is Josh. Um, I work for the Climate Movement. Uh, we've been trying to support um, the Climate Wikipedia at the University of Exeter. Meg, we've met. Um, so actually, we've been trying to do a lot of what you were talking about, about making things open access. And I haven't, I've admittedly failed at it. And I think that part of it is because you need to go really basic, like what is Wikimedia Commons? What does open access mean? What is Creative Commons? And looking at this, I kind of now understand it, but I've been working on this sort of on and off for two years, and I still kind of don't. So, and it's not a criticism at all, but it's making me think <coughs> if to, to approach organisations, I think that it's A, spelling out really simply, and also why it matters with case studies, and then the other thing is what you mentioned before about the legal issue, because they're like, oh, we need to get a lawyer's in it. And it's really, I think, the key is to make it make them realise it's important, and then they'll dedicate the time. But they initially like it, but then immediately once it's something that they feel like it's extra work for them, and it's not on their priority list. And also, and I hate to say this for everyone else who works for NGOs, it's easier to not make decisions when you work for an NGO than to make them. There's less upside than downside to get things wrong a lot of the time, or potentially right. So that it's, it's often easier to just be like, I'm not so sure, carry on as you were, rather than let's do it, and this is amazing. Like, people often don't see the upside, and I think that promoting that's really important. So yeah, I'd be delighted to work with you to come up with something that can be shared widely for organisations, which spells it out in very basic terms, including for myself. Thank you. Yeah, that would be appreciated. Thank you all so much for your questions and engaging with us. I know that all of us would be more than happy to answer any other questions that you might have. Thank you. Thank you.